This is our second panel on sustainable buildings. My name is Ellen Vaughn um, with EESI. And um, we, we talked um, in our last panel about um, important products and systems inside the building, um, mechanical insulation and um, uh, systems to uh, improve electrical uh, performance with controls and sensors. We talked about lighting. And, um, and I'm delighted now to uh, welcome our panel to talk about um, design issues and uh, envelope issues and, and really how, how it all comes together um, to, to make uh, a sustainable building. And first, uh, I'd like to introduce a builder who is really actually doing this. And, um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing when you see um, uh, a, a business person who has made the commitment, um, and it, it's it's a good business decision as well. So I am really happy to introduce Kier Grant de Grand Champ, uh, who's president of High Performance Homes. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting um, the model grand opening and. Um, uh, it's it's amazing and it's it's wonderful to experience high performance, uh, and uh, he's building homes that meet uh, a, a DOE uh, zero energy ready home certification. So, uh, care. How about that? <clears throat> How about this? Can you guys hear me? My name is Kier. I've been a builder since, uh, I guess, in the industry since 1983. Uh, I went into the zero energy ready concept about eight years ago. Intrigued me. I'm an engineer. I thought it was a possibility. Not anything that had been done, but a possibility. <clears throat> well, but lo and behold, after years of R&D, I started doing it, started building it. The way that we do it, we just take it from the, uh, basically, the outside envelope. The, make the home like a refrigerator. You make it as energy efficient, make it as tight as you possibly can. Uh, no air is moving around, no air escapes. We <clears throat> make sure that the inside of the home is quality controlled for indoor air quality, uh, humidity, uh, anything that could be harmful. Uh, we have an IAQ system, indoor air quality, that will knock out down to 0 .001 micron of any allergies, dust, <clears throat> debris. It's kind of like a hospital inside. We do the envelope and then we add PV, uh, photovoltaics. We use Dow solar shingles on our homes at the links of Gettysburg. And what that does is it offsets it. So the home is zero energy ready. The PV produces enough to make the home so it has no electric bill. <clears throat> we use a geothermal product for our HVAC system. Uh, it's a, probably 30 40% uh, more effective than air source units, and it's getting better every single day. We use all Energy, Energy Star appliances. Uh, we take our insulation to the ninth level. <clears throat> we use a SIPS panel on the exterior perimeter. Uh, it's 10 times stronger than conventional construction. We spray form our insulation. We blow in a minimum of a R49. That way, everything is nice and tight. We use energy efficient windows, <clears throat> well Tom's here, uh, we actually met through the NFRC conference and prior to, so it's, it's important that I have uh, the highest quality of products you know, all across the board. <clears throat> we at uh, High Performance Home have pledged that we will build every single home, not just one or two, every single home, to a zero energy ready status. There is less than 1% of these homes in the United States. I want, to, <laughs> I want to do it for the world. I think it's my responsibility, my responsibility for the nation, for the country. I want a carbon neutral. I want to offset everything we possibly can. These houses are worth it. <clears throat> you live in a cleaner environment. Everybody is, is happier and healthier. The, the comfort is unbelievable. It's just about soundproof as well. Uh, it looks like a regular home, acts like a regular home, but it doesn't. You don't have electric bills. You have a lot of comfort. We also are petitioning <clears throat> so that we can get uh, the tax credits incentivized. Uh, I believe there is on the floor of 45L, the new home tax credits. Uh, I support that. Uh, we're also talking about getting mortgages that are 
a reduced rate for these types of homes because they are less at risk than a regularly conventionally constructed home. Regularly con constructed homes are at a HERS 100. An Energy Star, which most people have heard of Energy Star, is about a HERS 63. Good builders are building to the 50s. We actually have our model home at a HERS 23. We have another one within the development that's a HERS 16. This is off the charts. We're not just practicing. We can, we're doing it day in, day out. So, <clears throat> all I want to do is change the world and keep doing it one house at a time. So. All right. Thank you, Kier. So putting it all together, energy efficiency and adding renewables and, and, uh, and getting uh, high performance. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, now turn to Paul Bertram, who is uh, Director of Environment, Sustainability, and Government Affairs with Kingspan Insulated Panels. Paul? Right. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and thanks for coming to hear our presentations. Uh, Kingspan is a global company out of Ireland, and they really wonder what the heck we're doing over here in the U.S. Um, in a couple meetings with the Department of Energy, um, they said, well, how did you make this all happen in Europe? And the answer was, we bloody well mandated it. So we're not going to get that here. Uh, so we have to figure out how we can influence this the best way we can. They have a number of divisions, by the way. They have uh, a, a solar division, uh, Kingspan Energy, which is out of Jessup, Maryland here. They have an insulation division headquartered out of um, uh, Atlanta. They have an under-air floor system that's headquartered out of Jessup, Maryland, and that's basically for data centers uh, and moving air. But the insulated metal panel division is the largest. And um, so echoing off of, of, of your uh, homes that you're building, uh, we think that uh, the envelope is being relatively ignored in the commercial market. So we're focused on the commercial market, and uh, my focus is envelope-first energy efficiency. So how many are familiar with basic building construction? If you were going to build a wall, can you imagine how many pieces and parts have to go into a wall system? Can you imagine how many trades might be involved in that? And if you were a really great architect, designer, engineer, and you had all the perfect details, where were the latent defects going to occur? They're going to occur in those trades and all those assemblies. So what if you could put out a wall system that looked like that, that met all the requirements. So a SIP, that is, this is the equivalent to a SIP. The difference between a SIP and an insulated wall panel is a SIP is actually a construction, uh, it, it actually is, um, it can assume uh, the structural integrity of the unit. So it, it doesn't require framing and things like that. You have to have a steel frame for insulated metal panels, so that would be the only difference. Uh, also, I think, I don't know, are there joints in your SIPs? I can't, can't remember. So we have, we have joints in these also, but you're eliminating a whole lot of things. These are both SIPs and insulated metal panels are off-site manufactured under high quality, um, higher quality, and faster build speeds, and they have a lot to offer. So we think that uh, at Kingspan, we think that there's more focus needing to be paid attention to the envelope. Uh, codes are driving new construction, so we feel like that's coming along. Yes, state to state it varies, and we have work to do there on driving uh, energy efficiency of the building envelope at the state levels. Um, but where I believe that the real benefit of these plays in is in deep energy retrofits on existing buildings. So I was involved in a project in Boston. It's called Castle Square. And if you're interested, I have a white paper. See me after the presentation. I'll be happy to send it out to you. But it was over 500,000 square feet of a, a seven-story facility that was built in the 1960s. It was a brick and concrete block structure that had no insulation in Boston, Massachusetts. So um, they decided that uh, the tenants, this was tenant owned, it was public private. So there are some investment uh, development companies in it, but the owners were tenant owners. And they decided they needed to upgrade the building. 
and basically through a series of studies, they decided that they were going to need to reclad the building. So we recladded it with this material. Um, interesting story. Uh, the tenants did not have to move out. Uh, there was some disruption, but it was a scheduled disruption. Uh, new windows got put in, uh, went up to an R5 window. Uh, they went to an R40, so they went from zero to an R40 on the exterior. The envelope represented a 30% improvement. Um, depending on who you want to talk to in this project, the developer involved said that they were 52% over baseline of where they started. Uh, the architect says they were at 68%. So DOE cheered anything over 50%. So it was pretty significant. And there's a lot to be learned out of it. And most importantly, in this white paper, we have one year of actual data uh, to uh, verify what the performance uh, actually was versus what was modeled and where things needed to be done. And one thing that I will tell you that came out that was significant was that uh, commissioning wasn't done until a year after the project was built. And part of this was a new boiler system and they had three uh, solar hot water units up on the roof and they were all there and looked really great. Two of them actually worked. Uh, one of them wasn't even hooked up to the system. So um, there was a lot to be learned and the essence of this is exactly what DOE is looking for. Repeatable, scalable models. What you're doing is a repeatable, scalable model. And um, although not quite passive house principles, we're pretty close to the air infiltration, exfiltration rates, and the insulation that you're looking for. Uh, and uh, so what's the barrier? Well, the payback on this project, depending on how you wanted to uh, peel the onion, was somewhere between 19 and 30 years payback. Um, so this was a pretty unique project in that it was a tenant-owned project. They didn't really care how long it took to get the payback because their utility bill went down significantly and they got the benefit of that right away. But if you're a building owner, maybe it's an office building, something like that, you might not want 30 years on the books. So I agree that we need to look for mechanisms and financing and incentives to help uh, do this. And there are a lot of them out there uh, but we, we need to influence that however we can legislatively. And, uh, and the reason is because the envelope is being ignored because energy is too cheap in the U.S. And uh, we have to create some sort of a carrots and sticks kind of uh, approach to this to, to get where we want to go. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was... Uh very helpful, and you really covered a lot of important issues. I appreciate that. Um, and one I'm going to pick up on is uh, the, the retrofit issue. Uh, that's uh, new construction in this country is what one percent typically of, of the housing of the building stock. So retrofits are critical, um, but it's also important that we do it right to begin with. So care, uh, you know, we won't have that that great need that we will, uh, because these will last uh, and, and still be performing well. And the other issue is performance, um, not just modeling. I mean, we need the good design, then we need to make sure that they're actually working as, as uh, intended. Um, and so, uh, so performance measurement and codes and standards, those things are all important. And that's a good thing uh, to, to have segue into uh, Tom Heron's uh, presentation. Tom is Director of Communications and Marketing for the National Fenestration Rating Council. Um, so looking at those um, uh, products, uh, part of the envelope, and, and um, how, how they measure up uh, is, is all important. So Tom? Yeah, thank you, Ellen. My name's Tom Heron uh, with the National Fenestration Rating Council. And, uh, Fenestration, of course, refers to windows, doors, and skylights. And I agree, um, the building envelope is absolutely ignored. Um, it's, it's overlooked in so many instances. But, you know, being here today, it makes me think about how far, at the same time, that green building and sustainability really has come. You know, just 50 years ago, it was a big goal among design 
professionals to keep the outdoors out as much as possible. In fact, I did a little research and back in 1961, the Downtown National Capital Committee in Washington, D.C. decided they were going to build a new central library. And so they hired a consulting firm to determine what features the building should have. And they came back and said, partly in their report, windows serve practically no useful purpose. Modern lighting and air conditioning methods have removed the need for reliance on natural light and air. Shocking. And it went on to say, a more even and satisfactory level of lighting and temperature can be achieved if there are no windows. Imagine this. And unfortunately, this idea kind of took hold and it persisted for a long, long time after that. So maybe this has something to do with why the building envelope is, is being ignored today. But, you know, we all know better. We know that windows do, in fact, play an important role and they improve our quality of life by making residential and commercial buildings uh, not just more energy efficient, but also more comfortable. And they do a lot to contribute to green building sustainability and they deliver a lot of health and human performance benefits. And NFRC's role, as Ellen mentioned in all of this, is serving as an independent third-party certification organization for energy performance for fenestration in residential and commercial buildings. And under our program, windows are independently tested, certified, and then labeled. So that's the consumer's and the building owner's assurance that when they see the label, they know that the product is going to perform up to the manufacturer's claims. It's kind of a watchdog system. And our uh, ratings also help the EPA determine which, which windows, doors, and skylights are going to be eligible for the Energy Star program. We were established back in 1989 as a kind of following the oil embargo of the 1970s. That's what really brought energy into the forefront. I, I talk about cheap energy. I can remember being a kid and uh, pulling up to the gas station. It was 15 cents a gallon. And we've certainly come a long way since then. But... It got to the point where manufacturers were making, window manufacturers were making a lot of outlandish claims about how well their products perform and something needed to be done about that. So fenestration industry leaders collaborated and created the NFRC. And as I mentioned, what that really does is hold manufacturers accountable and provides a layer of protection. And in 1992, we were recognized as the official rating council for windows, doors, and skylights in the Energy Policy Act. So why is all of this important? Because in addition to empowering homeowners to make more informed choices, NFRC's ratings programs enable code officials to verify compliance for commercial buildings. And this is one area where we can realize a tremendous amount of improvement. Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories in California uh, did a study uh, just a couple of years ago, and they concluded that the amount of energy being wasted through inefficient windows annually is about $50 billion. It's a staggering number, obviously. And today, only about 30% of commercial buildings in the U.S. are using high-performance windows. And the way that we can make improvements here is through increased code enforcement. And one of the reasons that this has been challenging, and we need policymakers to look at this, is that energy code enforcement a lot of times take a back, takes a backseat to health and safety issues. And another reason is just a lack of understanding. Uh, many people don't realize that windows are always performing. You know, we, we look at the windows right now and they're just kind of sitting there. We can't really see them doing anything. But there's always this tug of war going on. We have the air conditioner running. Meanwhile, the sun is beating in and there's constantly the struggle taking place. During the winter, this can really add up to... Uh, in your uh, utility costs because you have to blast your heat and in the summer the opposite tends to have an effect. And the way to take care of this is to really pay attention to your windows from the very outset in the integrated design uh, portion of a project. Uh, strategically placed windows can maximize passive solar design. And so, you know, why should policymakers care about this? Because in addition to reducing this $50 billion worth of wasted energy, High performance, have been, high performance windows have been shown to improve health and human performance, as we were uh, talking about earlier. And in fact, uh, a lot of you may be aware of this, but there are a lot of studies that show that people in hospitals 
that have adequate access to daylight, they tend to heal faster and require less pain medication. Students have been shown to retain information and do better on tests than their counterparts who study under artificial lights. And there are a number of other studies that just attest to the positive benefits of daylighting. And so this is an added benefit on top of the energy uh, that, we can, that we can save. And so because they play such an important role in making commercial buildings better, more energy efficient, healthier, policymakers can really set an example by requ requiring code enforcement in federal buildings in particular. That'd be a great place to get started. And this in turn would reinforce the need among local governments and throughout the private sector. And it also helps protect businesses by ensuring that uh, the buildings they occupy are the most energy efficient. So reducing this $50 billion loss, it helps bolster the economy. You know, that when businesses are spending less money on energy, they have more money to reinvest into their businesses. And additionally, it would also create new jobs. There are a lot of benefits here. As building codes evolve, uh, new jobs for quality control assessors, building commissioning professionals, and energy auditors would emerge. And policymakers can support these initiatives requiring fenestration energy code compliance in commercial buildings. And one way to do this would be by tying compliance uh, to eligib eligibility for funding. And this is really important because a lot of people think that it's the transportation industry that uses the most energy in the U.S., but it's actually the buildings. And that's why we need to pay more attention to this and particularly to windows in the building envelope. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's so important, as we know. We, we like to have natural light. And I have to say, when I stood in front of uh, the window at Kier's house, uh, upstairs, if, if, if I was in my house, it would be hot and, uh, and cold downstairs, probably. Um, it was comfortable. It was, what, 90-something outside. It was comfortable inside. It was, I felt no heat coming in that window. And it was, you know, but I could still look out and uh, it didn't have any film on it. It was just, uh, it was the experience. People, I think, have to be inside better buildings to know what, what makes them better. So, um, uh, so thank you. The win windows and uh, technologies, and I think we have a lot of opportunities too, sometimes, uh, uh, we can't get all the products that we'd like in this country, so I think we have a lot of opportunities for manufacturing um, and uh, creating new jobs with, with even higher performing products. Uh, Katrin Klingenberg is uh, co-founder and executive director of the Passive House Institute U.S., and Katrin will uh, talk about what you've heard some people allude to, the passive house design. Um, and I think it really, I mean, literally will wrap and tie together a lot of these, a lot of these other issues. And um, so, Katrin, I, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. And I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Alan. And um, uh, I think it's probably no coincidence that you placed me last. <laughs> Uh, that is indeed true. So uh, what is Passive House? It's uh, um, uh, maybe not a particularly attractive name, but it has gained some recognition recently in the uh, building efficiency market. And uh, um, well, everybody already touched on the elements that go into a passive building. We have a super insulated uh, airtight envelope uh, used compared to the refrigerator. That's uh, in the colder climates, we typically refer to like a thermos bottle. <laughs> so you retain the heat gains that you have inside of the building and you make use of the passive means of heating and cooling uh, your building. Now that's uh, actually a really cool thing. Uh, if you design in that holistic way and you um, employ all these different technologies, um, you end up with a uh, building system that uh, is at the same time a uh, mitigation strategy for climate change and also an adaptation strategy for climate change. So um, instead of just only focusing on the numbers and the building efficiency, uh, we probably also need to start thinking about making our buildings more resilient and that's what passive building also does. 
Um, so how do you know that you have actually a passive building? And this is where the numbers come in. Uh, we might not have to go too much into detail, but uh, it's important to know where that uh, specific point uh, is set that we certify to. And uh, amongst all the building systems, certification systems, green building uh, systems, we are probably unique because we have like really a pass fail, a clear line in the sand. So if you meet this particular energy performance, then you're in the club. And if not, then you're out the club, <laughs> outside of it. We have a very strict energy uh, efficiency standard that also includes high uh, air tightness um, levels. So uh, wh wh where does this number come from, right? Like, did we pull this out of thin air? Uh, it's actually a direct response to kind of like now zooming back out, big picture. Uh, what do we need to achieve? What is our main objective? Our main objective is to meet our uh, climate and carbon reduction goals globally. And that's where we started when we, when we formulated the standard. So how much carbon do we have to, have to save globally? Uh, then we can calculate back how much is that per person and then we can translate that into a particular performance metric that we measure buildings against. Why is this important to policymakers? Well, it's starting to become maybe something like a safety issue, right? Like I walk, we're based in Chicago and uh, I walk the streets of Chicago and not very many buildings um, are employing these strategies. There are actually two condo buildings going up right and left from my apartment right now. There's not a lick of insulation in these buildings. And it's, I don't know, in my personal opinion, it's kind of scandalous. It's essentially, we're still building tents out there. And uh, you might have seen some of the infrared photos that have been taken of uh, very beautifully designed star architect skyscrapers. They are essentially like radiators plugged into the utility grid. We're heating the atmosphere. And if you equate like the energy consumption of a building to the uh, carbon emissions that are related to what they're using, then it's, it's, it's a real shocker. Uh, that is like becoming a health and safety issue. We need to curb carbon emissions of buildings that they are allowed to put out into the atmosphere. The atmosphere being our, like um, um, the, the ultimate commons, if you will. So with our standard setting uh, and program, uh, we, we do education. How do you get there? We teach folks how to design to these standards, uh, how to effectively integrate all these systems that we've been talking about. And uh, we also certify buildings, make sure that the specifications that the architect puts on the drawings, uh, that that actually gets uh, being put into place and that the <coughs> building performs the way it has been modeled. And um, mm, so we uh, started about like 10 years ago. And uh, we have some really pretty exciting news to report. This year has been absolutely phenomenal, and I, I'm not really sure what's happening. There's a disturbance in the force, so maybe there's finally some political will. Uh, it might have all started with the One City report uh, from uh, New York City's uh, Mayor de Blasio that he uh, issued last September. You might have seen that one. Uh, New York City committed to an 80% carbon reduction by 2050, and uh, one of the strategies that they very immediately identified was uh, passive building uh, standards and principles. And uh, they named one particular project, which is one of the very first multifamily certified passive buildings in New York City. Uh, it's called the Knickerbocker Project by architect Chris Benedict. And uh, it is also an affordable project, and she built it for the same cost, cost parity. Uh, now imagine that. And uh, since then, there have been a couple other uh, people looking at the systems of, of Passive House. And um, you might have seen this recently, um, like an article was in the New York Times, uh, the to be tallest passive building in the world just broke ground. Uh, Cornell is um, building a residence hall. And another mid-rise uh, is also just breaking ground, uh, developed by a for-profit developer who claims that he can build it for 1% additional cost for-profit development. So these are all really excellent news. And what we're finding, if you get into bigger buildings, the insulation value is really not that much more than code, actually. Like those uh, larger buildings, they have an envelope of about an R30, R35, maybe R40. But that, that would be already a little bit smaller building. Uh, so we can do this. We absolutely can do this. And I, I believe very strongly that passive building will be a cornerstone to achieve our carbon neutral goals uh, was talked about earlier to eliminate carbon from our uh, from our way of life. So, uh, oh yeah, um, before I go, um, we actually had some policy success. Uh, the City Council of New York City did uh, propose legislation that would require all capital buildings to meet uh, 
our uh, certification fees plus, uh, and uh, that is groundbreaking. Uh, that is really quite something. So the city to come forward saying like to meet our carbon reduction goals, we will require uh, that standard or similar or equivalent. Of course, they cannot write just like one one group into into legislation. And just yesterday, the city of Seattle voted uh, that uh, projects mid rise. Uh, in the city of Seattle will be allowed to build uh, to a higher FAR. So they, they are going to be allowed to build more square footage on the same lot than other projects would be allowed to who are not built to this energy efficiency standard. So we're seeing a couple of these really good things happening. And also in the affordable market, um, HUD, uh, Green Communities criteria, they're starting to look at passive uh, to incentivize um, uh, affordable developers because, of course, it's a win-win for everybody, it's a win-win for them. They pay less energy, they have lower fo maintenance footprints, and the uh, affordable uh, renters, they pay less utility bills. So um, we really hope that this will take off. We are currently seeing a hockey stick growth curve. And um, thank you, Ellen, for all your great work and your great support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gatrin. What a great wrap up. Yes. if. Uh, I think resiliency could have certainly been in that uh, in the title, and that is um, that is critical. Tom, you mentioned a little bit ago that the building sector uses most of the energy, and that that's true. Some people don't uh, think about that, but building that's just a building operation. It's about forty percent of our total energy use, seventy percent of the electricity use. Employing these strategies uh, really is getting that down to almost. We're, we're getting down to zero, and buildings are, uh, we have the technologies, the expertise, the uh, uh, best practices to, um, to, to actually create buildings that produce energy. So uh, these, are, these are becoming um, more and more as we train more of the building professionals and as we certify more of the products as we have uh, innovators who are taking a chance and getting out there and, and showing that it can be done cost competitively. And the beauty of it is that we address uh, environmental uh, problems while we also create better places to live. Uh, and we spend about 90% of our time indoors. Think about that. That's kind of stunning. Uh, and so we really should make sure that that environment is, is uh, conducive to our health and safety and well-being. Um, and oh, by the way, we could save money and we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so it, it's definitely a win-win. This industry is um, estimated at, um, I think, 3.5%. 6% of the construction industry, 3.6% of the GDP. Um, but think about manufacturing all these products, the jobs that go into uh, installing, servicing. Um, so it, it's, it's a huge part of our economy. And the more that these new products are being built here, um, this is growing our economy in a sustainable way right now. So I am so thankful that all of you came in to tell this story, and you did it so eloquently. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. Um, really appreciate it. And please do uh, call any of us if you have uh, questions. And, um, and we'll have our next panel, I think, in just a couple minutes. And we'll wrap it up. So thank you. Oh, any questions? Do we have a minute for questions, perhaps? I'm not sure. This ends at 345, so yeah. Hi. Uh, so I've, I've worked on one of more of these, these horrific Starkitect buildings. Um, and um, they like a lot of glazing. Uh, and, and a lot of the time they'll cite, oh, well, there are these new high emissivity windows or low emissivity windows or something. Um, so it's okay now we can put, uh, we can glaze the entire building. Um, do you think the kind of guidelines and policies exist right now to ensure that the right kinds of windows are being used on the right faces of the buildings and that um, 
relatively high tech windows aren't being abused um, and not really being incorporated into the holistic design? It's getting a lot better actually because uh, whole building commissioning is starting to um, become more prominent. You know, there's uh, a, a lot of thinking that code compliance is, is the most important thing and that's kind of been the prevailing attitude for a long, long time. That's beginning to shift toward being able to show ongoing performance and probably the most efficient buildings in the future aren't going to be the ones that initially met the code, but the ones that you can keep showing over and again how well they're performing. And that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, policymakers can make a big difference by promoting things to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 would, I would second that. It's getting better. Uh, so in New York City, I, I was surprised. Um, uh, they are also now requiring, actually, architects to pay attention to thermal bridging, even though they have not made, made a decision yet to put, like, one energy performance metric on uh, on it in, in terms of code, but that that is already going a long ways. But I would still say, like, no matter how good the window performs, you we will have to move away from the all glass buildings. It's not that. so. For example, like the the concrete slabs, they they all go straight to the outside, right? The um, if you don't have a curtain wall, so that's a huge thermal bridge right there. Uh, just as an example, um, if we pay attention to that, maybe maybe we can get there. So when do we test a building to know whether it's performing right or wrong? After it's built. So there is a new standard out called the Building Enclosure Commissioning Standard, and ASTM puts that out. And that is a way to do incremental testing as the building's being built to make sure that it will more reasonably deliver the intended design and output. And that's also uh, the basis of driving something called outcome-based performance codes, which you're going to see more of as time goes on. Thank you all. Was there another question over here? Yes, sir. I guess get it, uh, get the performance out to the public. Um, just like we've been building these homes very successfully, but nobody knows we're doing it. Uh, Sam Raskin, who is uh, DOE, he's the chief architect for you know, the Zero Energy Ready Program, which is the adherence that we build to. Uh, he's standing at, at the highest podium. He's trying to get the word out. We're trying to do it ourselves. It's just a function of nobody knows it's there. Uh, Passive House, <clears throat> eight years ago, I didn't know what it was. And now you probably ask one in five people, hey, FIAS, what is a FIAS? Can you please spell that? And that is the technology that we're all going towards. And again, this is, you know, it's a sustainable, it's affordable, it is the, <clears throat> it's the right of the country to the future. And this is what we should do. And how we get it out? Just by doing it. I mean, doing it and, you know, uh, glorifying it. Saying, okay, yes, we do have a HERS 16 that's in existence on the links of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. And it has not an electric bill and it will not. Nobody knows about it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, these people, that specific couple, they don't even want to tell their neighbors they're embarrassed. No. <clears throat> they so there, feel there are lots of associations, uh, trade associations, AIA, USGBC, lots of ways that we can deliver the education. Um, but what is the education? That is the key. And the missing link in all of this is building science and building physics. And that that's we have to bring all of that into a focus. Architects are not taught, other than a few technical colleges, they're not taught building physics or building science. And we're at a level now, when we start talking about system performance and outcomes, we have got to get there. And so that's where the education needs to be, is on building science and building systems and building physics. Yeah, and I'd like to second that. So uh, because it was absent in the marketplace and we had absolutely no, nothing to work with when we first started, we started our own training program. So we have a training program for certified passive house consultants who are doing the designing, like this would be the architects who show up and they get taught building science and the modeling tools. We have one training program for builders. 
Um, and actually, in fact, the builders are really excited. Uh, I think a lot of builders, they do things like uh, every day the same, but um, at first they were like, wow, the, you guys are crazy with your air tightness. And then it was a real nice challenge and people really get into it and they really have fun Absolutely. doing it. And you're <laughs> saying it like you're, you're excited about your job, it, right? It is an absolute challenge to build so, it day in, day out. Exactly. And like you were saying, when do you test it? Uh, how we test our homes, we do it as we go along. We drywall, we do a, a blower door, we do a duct blaster, which means probably very little to everybody, but us up here go, that's awesome. I got an ACH 50 of 1.1, and she's terribly excited because <laughs> she knows that we're right there. Um, it's important to know what the house is doing as we're moving along. Because like you said, you wait till the end, all of a sudden something fails. You don't know why it failed. You're in so, a forensic mode then. <laughs> exactly. And like, you know, our SIPS panel is very similar to yours, the thermal bridging. We don't have two by fours. We don't have headers. It's 10 times stronger without it. So minimize the thermal bridging. You don't have it. There's less sound transference. There's no less heat and you know, loss. And it starts before it gets to the builder. We need to re-teach people how to design. Uh, there was emphasis on the integrated design, bring everybody together up front, and uh, don't get into forensic mode because right. that is expensive. And if you do it right from the beginning, it's really not difficult. Absolutely, and, and thank you for saying that because uh, one example, even uh, with, uh, with paint, you might think, well, that could be substituted. Um, but if you have a particular, for example, daylighting scheme that requires a certain re reflectivity, um, and that gets sort of substituted down the line because that specialty contractor wasn't involved, um, that can change the numbers, that can change the whole uh, uh, performance. So it, it has to be, uh, has to come together in an integrated way. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your good question. I wish there was a simple answer, but it really is <laughs> about um, uh, professional training, um, and I think there are some institutional challenges we're going to talk mm -hmm. about in our next panel. Um, things like, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, electric grid, and um, perhaps uh, we'll talk about financing. Um, the way we value, uh, you know, builders should be seeing the, the value that they're putting in. Homeowners should be uh, seeing the value, insurance. Um, and uh, getting a loan, they should, you know, be get credit for not spending a lot of money on energy. I mean, that's that's helping. Um, we just have systems in place that really haven't caught up with this yet. So I think there's a lot of room for um, some policy um, uh, thinking, and and it doesn't. Uh, it, it can be, I think, across the whole spectrum of education and financing a lot of things. So thank you for that. Um, thank you all so much for um, your wonderful uh, presentations and thank you for coming um, to the buildings panel.